Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And welcome to this session of the 2021 Aerospace Warfare Symposium. Now, while we traditionally hold this event in person, uh, we're excited to exploit the opportunities of this year's virtual format. While I certainly miss seeing friends and having the opportunity to exchange ideas in person, uh, today we're able to share this important conversation with a far broader audience. Changing threats mean changing training, and that's what this session's all about. We see a combination of factors ranging from the evolving threat landscape to the emergence of new technologies and the planned introduction of a new trainer aircraft that are combining to create a unique moment in the history of Air Force pilot training. Now today we're joined by two leaders and experts in this field, each of whom are tasked with navigating the opportunities and challenges facing the Air Force's training enterprise. They will discuss the evolution of training from advances in virtual reality to the imperative for all airmen to know and understand the adversaries that they might face in the future. And as with previous inflection points, their actions may well shape the future of pilot training for generations to come. So we're very glad to have the opportunity to hear their perspectives today. With that as context, let me introduce our panelists. Major General Craig Wills is the commander of 19th Air Force, the component of the Air Education and Training Command is responsible for providing flight training. Prior to leading the 19th, General Wells served as the Deputy Chief in the Office of Security Cooperation at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad and as a Director of Strategic Plans at Pacific Air Forces. Major Corky Cochran, Corcoran is the co uh, Commander of the U.S. Air Force Warfare Center at Nellis Air Force Base, where he oversees the Air Force's advanced training schools exercises, and other training venues. He previously served as the Director of Operations of Strategic Deterrence and Nuclear Integration at Air Force Headquarters in Europe, and as a Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations at NATO Allied Air Command. So I'd like to start by giving Major General Wills the floor, followed by General Cochran for your thoughts on this subject. So sticks over to you, General Wills. Thank you, General Deptula. Sir, it's uh, great to see you again, and it's great to be with the Mitchell Institute and all of the folks who are listening uh, through virtual means here. You know, we live in an exciting time, and, and uh, in the true sense of the, the Chinese expression, these are interesting times, and we will be challenged, as the Mitchell Institute has done a great job of trying to continue to explain to folks. So when at the Air Education and Training Command, when we step back and look at our role, the foundational uh, training that we do to prepare warfighters to go out and join General Corcoran and those in the CAF and the MAF and AFSOC to take the future fight uh, forward. We look at these trends and we ask ourselves, how is warfare really going to change and what are the ways that we need to adapt? And I think fundamental to the discussion is this idea of whether we think machines are going to fight wars or whether we think people are going to fight wars. And obviously we're going to need some awesome machinery but the core of our belief is that people are still gonna be the warfighters. And so the bulk of our efforts are not really technological. It's how do we make a better warfighter and a better human and how do we uh, harness technology uh, to do that? So we've got a few exciting things underway. One of the things that uh, we've, we've tried to shift towards in AETC is this idea of learner-centric training and a competency-based approach. One of the great strengths of our Air Force and really of, of our entire military in the past has been that we've developed really great training systems that I would say are industrial in nature. If you picture just a really large funnel, you can put almost any shape of airman in the top of that thing. And if you turn the crank uh, long enough and in the right sequence out the other side, you'll get uh, a fairly uniform set of widgets. Those might be firefighters or they might be uh, civil engineers or they might be pilots or, or combat systems officers. And you know, it's been a really successful model. The challenge is that we are increasingly aware that all of our airmen come to, the, come to the Air Force with a certain set of skills and every one of them is a little bit different. And so if the question is, does your training system harness the individual skills that each airman brings right now? I'd say the answer is no. We tend to have, a, have had a one size fits all approach to the training. The research we've done over the last couple of years suggests that 80% of the time learners will learn faster if you let them. 
And for those of your listeners out there that have been through an Air Force or any uh, military flight training program, they'll remember very well that if you get ahead of the rest of the class by four or five days, there's one thing that's sure to happen to you. And that's that you're gonna get sat down until the rest of the class catches up. Well, we're trying to look at things differently uh, now. And we've, um, we've tried to orient on the idea that let's bring out the very best of, that, of each airman and let's design training systems that are flexible enough to take advantage of the attributes and talents that people already have, rather than driving everybody to one common uh, denominator. So with that, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, ATC launched something called Pilot Training Next. And I like to describe this as either the original Starbucks store or the shot heard around the world. However you wanna look at it, uh, Pilot Training Next is the seed and it's really the engine of our innovation efforts. And it started with this basic principle that there might be a different way you can do pilot training. Now, when I went to navigator training in 1991, I was issued a black and white poster of the T-37 cockpit. And then in 2000, and, or really in 1995, I went to pilot training, I was issued the same poster. And when I went to T-6 pilot instructor training in 2009, I was issued a T-6 poster and the, the radical advancement in our training tools was that my T6 poster was in color in parts. Now, if that's, you know, if that constitutes the state of the art in training aids, then we've got a real problem. But the simple fact of the matter is that if you brought in an F100 pilot, and if you brought in an F4 pilot and an F15 pilot and an F22 pilot, the one thing that they would all be able to identify with is the pilot training syllabus. And so we think that there might've been a better way and our pilot training next uh, team helped us uh, drive that. So we graduated three separate classes and the premise was, could you train an FTE ready pilot in half the time? And by and large, the Pilot Training Next experiment proved that you can do that, although it was not perfect. And there are certainly uh, pluses and minuses. So a, about a year and a half ago, General Goldfein said, uh, after taking one of the briefs, he looked to General Webb and I, and he said, I want you to scale this program. And so uh, as we've moved out to do that, we've launched something last summer on July 15th, Advance and Randolph that we call UPT 2.5. And the reason we call it UPT 2.5, you know, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that everything needs a name and that's as good a, a good a name as any. Uh, but what we really wanted to convey was the idea that um, you shouldn't wait 60 years between software refreshes on your pilot training system. And so 2.5 should tell everybody that there's a 3.0 that's gonna come and there's gonna be a, a 3.1 or a 3.5. And our Air Force, just like our adversaries are doing needs to continually evolve and adapt in the way that we train. So when we looked at what would we scale, we, we took that we considered the, the uh, initially four proven concepts and we've expanded to a fifth. And the first one is enabling seamless access to content. And so you might remember from your days, sir, in pilot training that, that there was this overwhelming preoccupation with the idea that if we weren't careful, we might give Lieutenant Deptula an unfair advantage in pilot training. That somehow one person might get a leg up and have an inside track on being the DG in the class. And so as a consequence, you couldn't get the books for the next phase until right before the, the next phase started. You know, all these things uh, were frowned upon. And we've tried to change the aperture and say, let's give as much information that's appropriate to people as soon as they can so that we can build a layer of knowledge that we can then build upon and build a better pilot in the time that we have. The second one, the one that gets the most attention is this idea of technology. And so the, the, the principle was let's integrate immersive technology. The simple fact to the matter is that there's still a lot of people around that believe that the first time anybody meets an airplane, it's gonna be with us. But the reality is that there's tens of thousands of people all over the world who are teaching themselves to fly today using commercially available software and tools. And so the idea was why wouldn't the best tools be available in the Air Force? And so we've launched uh, the development of what we call immersive training devices. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that later, but there's some really exciting developments in this. The fact is people show up at pilot training today and they've got lots and lots of time uh, practicing. And there are people who do this for fun. Why in the world wouldn't we be cutting edge on this? The third principle was transitioning to a learner centric uh, way of teaching. And this won't be a surprise to folks, but everybody learns a little bit differently. And uh, so why don't we incorporate syllabi that reflect the fact that it's not always linear and that people have strengths and weaknesses. So let's build a syllabus that's, that's rigid enough to uphold a really high standard, but it's flexible enough to allow you to kind of uh, tap into people's progress in ways that, that lead to better performance. And so that's exciting. Uh, quality instruction at an acceptable IP to student ratio is a next uh, tenant. 
it makes perfect sense that it takes time to train people. And the pace at pilot training is one of those things that we always have to deal with. But quality instruction is the trump card. You know, if you have to choose between a better tool and a better instructor, you'll pick a better instructor every time. And then the fifth one, the one that we added was the idea of optimizing human performance. You've heard of the uh, ACC's optimizing the human weapon system. AFSOC has had the uh, POTIF, of the preservation of the force and family for a long time. So it just seems obvious that rather than waiting for our lieutenants to go out and get broken in the MAGCOMs and then fixed, why don't we start from the very beginning with a nutritionist, a strength co coach, cognitive specialist. Let's build a better human, a more resilient, more adaptable, a better thinker. And let's build that into pilot training from the beginning. We call it CRAFT, the Comprehensive Readiness for Aircrew Flying Training Initiative. And it promises uh, a lot of uh, potential for us. So uh, that's really the stuff that we've tried to bring into UPT. 2.5. We think fundamentally we're going to create a better pilot, a more competent pilot, and a pilot that's better ready uh, to fight in the 21st century. For many of you that have been through flight training, you might remember at night, the night before your check ride, you practiced your favorite profile that, and you hoped you'd get the airspace that's closest to the base. You hoped there'd be no wind, that the runway that's always in use would be the runway that you go to. And on the day of the check ride, if everything lined up perfectly, you did a good job, you got a great grade. Well, today, what we're trying to do is encourage people to seek out harder and more demanding profiles. We're trying to reward performance when people challenge themselves. We're trying to build in a lot more scenarios where they have to think and adapt and replan and refly. We're trying to put more responsibility on the learner from day one because we know that the fight of today is growing more complex and the fight of tomorrow is going to happen. The most important thing that's going to happen in that fight is going to happen in between the ears of our warriors. And so that's where we're really uh, focused. Beyond that, sir, we've got a, a lot of exciting initiatives that are related to that. We're trying to find new ways to train. We're challenging old assumptions, like the idea that you have to fly two airplanes in pilot training. One has to be slow and one has to be fast and it has to take a year. We're trying to look at it differently. We're pursuing alternate paths to wings to take advantage of folks' civilian experience. The heart of all of that is a really robust assessment mechanism where we find out really what people know when they get here and build training programs to adapt. And so it's never been a more exciting time uh, in AETC. And the last point I'll make uh, before I get off the stage uh, for now, is I haven't really mentioned the cloud yet or this idea that uh, everything doesn't have to be linear. If you imagine um, a scenario where everything that you do is connected in the cloud and you have access to, to content on demand and on command, and there's a mix of content from augmented reality to virtual reality, good old fashioned reading assignments, good old fashioned slideshows that you have to click through and, and regs that you have to read. But now imagine that's all available to you in the cloud along with all of the data from every simulator and every flight that you do. And now imagine that there's an AI helper that crawls through all of your performance data and all of the curriculum and all of the syllabus and gives you tips. Everything from what we're doing now, which is a very basic way of providing AI flight instruction in our immersive training devices, all the way up to the point where it sends you a note and says, Hey, Lieutenant Deptula, the three things you're doing really well right now, great attitude, great shoe shine, great haircut. You know, the three things you need work on, airspeed on final, uh, you know, touchdown in the, uh, in the touchdown zone and uh, after landing checks. But you know, anybody can tell you how much uh, work you need to do, but now imagine that that AI tool points you to the content that you need to review. Imagine that that AI tool sends you over to the immersive training device and it has a pre-recorded uh, set of uh, exercises for you to run through. And now imagine uh, that it sends your instructor the same note and cues the instructor on the things the instructor needs to focus on to make you a better student. That's awesome. And that's where we're trying to go. And then remember that all of that's inherently cloud-based, which means your instructor can teach you from home or from wherever he or she is at, put on the virtual reality goggles, jump in the simulator with you and you provide your real-time instruction. That's happening right now at Pilot Training Next and at Vance and at Randolph. And it's just the very, very beginning. So it's a very exciting time, sir. And I look forward to your questions. That's great. Let's turn it over to uh, Major General uh, Corcoran, please. Thanks, General Deptula. I appreciate uh, your leadership there at the Mitchell Institute to uh, to make this happen despite COVID. We, like you said at the beginning, we would all rather be together in person. But uh, hopefully, you heard a little jet noise in the background from me, uh, from my location, from Paul. So uh, that, that'll help uh, help the crowd get uh, get enthusiastic about what we're talking about today. Thanks, Paul. It's great to see you. And thanks for your leadership at ATC. Uh, you know, here at the Warfare Center, just like you mentioned, General Deptula, our job is to take the great product that Air Education and Training Command gives to the operational units and then sharpen the sword 
uh, before they uh, they get pushed forward to combatant commanders. And so, uh, so you know, the, the the title of this I love training for war. That's the title of this segment that we're doing. And uh, on our end, operational training. When you talk about operational training, it's you know it's measured in readiness. And we always like to ask training to be ready for what? And it, to me, it boils down real simply into three things. First, to execute the Air Force core missions that haven't changed since 1947, uh, that, that our nation expects us to do, to do those in conjunction with our joint interagency and coalition partners, and at a level that, uh, that we need to, to uh, defeat uh, any adversary today or into the future. And, and as we talk about the emerging technology and the evolving threat, how does that play into those three things? Well, you know, for fundamentally, our, our core missions haven't changed. So, and the work that we do at the Warfare Center, we need to we need to make sure that our that our folks understand that that we provide domain superiority, airspace and cyber, that we provide global strike anywhere on the globe, anytime, that we do lift, that we do ISR, and we provide the C2 infrastructure required to make that all happen. That has not changed. Our Air Force, our, our Air Force does that for the Joint Force, for our allies, and for our nation. Again, to defeating the adversary. But how does the evolving uh, threat and the emergency tech impact the other ones? Well, it, it changes what we need to know about our own capabilities, our partner capabilities, and about our, our adversaries capabilities. And that's where we get into that great power competition discussion. So the, the things that you said up front that we do at the Warfare Center, the, you know, the advanced training schools, the exercises, and then providing the venues, I'll hit on those real quick and, and then, we can, then we can go to some, some questions. But the, the advanced training schools and the exercises, we'll talk about that first. That boils down to the weapon school as, as one of our primary advanced training school and flag exercises. I mean, there's a little bit more to it than those, but we can just talk, talk in, in broad terms about, about how the evolving uh, threat and emergence tech uh, impacts those. First off, the tech. Um, what we've done, uh, because tech is it, it's so emergent, it's, it's changing so rapidly, uh, I'll applaud the acquisition community and the, the, and the Air Force and DOD bureaucracy writ large. We, we have now allowed warfighters, the operational warfighters to start getting their hands on that tech earlier. We used to have this very uh, um, series approach where, hey, nothing goes to operational test until it's specifically done with development. It doesn't go to the, the operational warfighter until, until it's done with operational test. What, what I applaud our, our acquisition community for and our test community, both OT and DT, is they're putting things in the hands of the kids going through weapon school and flag exercises earlier as much as 12 to 18 months before it's before it's going to be operational so they can get their hands on it they can still shape the way it's that that particular widget is, it, or piece of software is being developed uh and they're starting to develop tactics earlier that's going to get it in the hands of the operational war, war fighter sooner so that's one of the one of the ways that uh, that the emerging emerging techs are impacting the schools and, and the flags the other thing is the evolving threat um i can imagine back in uh back in the day in the cold war that flag exercises in, in the gunnery school at the time or the tactical fighter weapon school was focused on the Soviet Union. After the Cold War ended, up until you know in the last year or so, uh, we've been searching for what to train to, quite frankly, quite honestly. I mean, you know, since September 11th, we've been very focused on the Middle East, on how to take out uh, you know, terrorists riding on a moped. Um, but we've got a singular focus now on great power competition across our, across our portfolio period dot. So if you go to the weapon school and you look at their, uh, from day one, whether it's the individual uh, MDSs that are training all the way to, the, to the, uh, the culminating phase where they have weapon school integration, the scenarios are all now focused on China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, primarily. And I'll, I'll even say more towards China, all right? China is the pacing threat and that's what we're trying to graduate our weapons officers, our tier one weapons officers are gonna lead operational units tonight for combatant commanders with the knowledge they need uh, as best we can give them uh, to go take on China should they have to do it uh, next week, next month after they graduate. In the past, that didn't happen. In the past, it was made up scenarios. So if you're in Coyote Moa up on the Nellis Range, uh, we made up a country called the Coyotians and we made up a threat laid down and that's what we are fighting. No more. We are gonna teach them all about China. When they graduate, they know about China and they know what they can do uh, with the tools they have uh, to beat China. And we're doing the same thing in the flag enterprise. So that is that is a significant shift, and I think it's a shift in the right direction. So that covers our advanced training schools and our exercises. The other piece you hit on that we do is the venues, and this one is near and dear to my heart. I think it's near and dear to all of us. Uh, I'm, I was really proud that uh, when we stood up AFWIC, we had 12 cross-functional teams looking at the design of the future force. But we, as an Air Force, worked together to stand up a 13 one, a 13th one called OTTI, Operational Training and Test Infrastructure. 
for the sole purpose of is you design the new force, we got to build in the venues live and virtual that we need and fund them that we need to train for great power competition, to train for the threat moving forward. In the past, we've done this as an afterthought and we're paying for it in spades now. And I say operational training and test because what this is doing is bringing together a couple of stovepipes that currently, that, that previously existed for good reasons, but in the A3 on the air staff, the operational training infrastructure funding, and then the TE sort of portfolio, the test enterprise. If we can bring those together because we do a lot of work in the same areas using the same systems and, and not pay twice for things, that's going to be helpful moving forward. So what we're doing, we're looking, we're splitting OTTI into live and virtual, right? There's the live venues, uh, and, and, and in each of these, live and virtual, you need aggressors. You need air aggressors, cyber aggressors, space aggressors, land aggressors. And that's just from the Department of the Air Force portfolio, right? Uh, and then in the virtual world, we, we've got it. We are working hard to shift more and more of this to the virtual world, simply because the, the scope and the scale that you need is not available anywhere in any live venue. So we're working very hard to nail down uh, what we need to do live, what we must do live, and then shifting other things to virtual to get that scope, that scale, and to get a real, uh, a real, the real uh, level of fidelity we need to, to train our operational units against the adversaries. And so that's a lot of the, uh, the important work we're doing. And the, as we do that in the Department of the Air Force, it is a absolute must that we collaborate, not just across the department, but the interagency and with our partners, because this needs to be a whole whole of us and whole of partner effort to get this right uh, we'll do better if we fund it together and work on it together i'll stop there sir so we can get on to questions thanks and hey, no thank uh thank both of you for uh, those uh, insights up front uh let's jump into a little more detail uh general wills the 19th air force uh, mm -hmm. and aetc are spearheading an effort to embrace new technology uh, to solve a uh, pilot shortage how do you evaluate the effectiveness of new technological training aids? And what are the training benchmarks that you're seeking to meet in the coming year? Sure, great question. Um, you know, generally speaking, I would say that the, um, in the very beginning, the tech caught a lot of attention because it's different. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, certainly transitioning from a, a baseline of a poster on a wall to a kind of a home-built simulator was a big change. What we found is that we continue to make really rapid progress uh, with respect to those immersive training devices. So a year ago, a year and a half ago, I actually had one you know, in my home uh, while I was working on my T6 upgrade. And that particular model was very much a gaming rig. So a couple of monitors, a gaming laptop, the stick, um, you know, no real force feedback on the stick or the rudder pedals. And over that time, since that time, we've collaborated with industry and we actually have upgraded to the point where there's force feedback in the stick and the rudders. We've upgraded the generations of the virtual reality headset that we're using. We've got faster processing and we've got better aero models. All of those things in a price point that's still dramatically cheaper. I mean, you're talking about a, the price point of a little more than uh, tens of thousands of dollars compared to a $26 million standalone simulator. And the beauty of it is it's accessible to you 24 seven. So in terms of the effectiveness, unbelievably effectiveness for what we're asking of it. Now, some people say it's not as good as a full $26 million simulator, and you'll get no argument from us. But if the question is, can you practice traffic patterns using 3D video and reasonably good force feedback and a, an aero model that's reasonably accurate and get a lot of training value, the answer is absolutely at an unbelievably cheap uh, price point. So we have some work to do. Much of it is educating folks to make sure they know what we're trying to do and what we're not trying to do with the tech. In terms of the benchmarks, one of the big concerns we have is that um, the fact of the matter is we're, we've done all of this on the backs of our airmen, which honestly, that's how the Air Force moves forward is on the backs of our airmen. But we've asked an awful lot of people and a lot of the tech solutions have had to be worked in real time by a bunch of people wearing green bags or OCPs who also have another day job called training pilots. So one of the big things that we've tried to do over the last year is to get to a common immersive training device platform instead of having to grow your own uh, mentality across the force. We wanna take the best of local innovation and then harness that in a standardized way that's repeatable. So we, we uh, had a commercial so, uh, solutions opening through the Defense Innovation Unit. We went out to industry and let some contracts and now we have a prototype of a common ITD. That common ITD is more robust, more importantly, it's something that can be uh, upgraded to a common standard. It's something that can be maintained in a common way. And we're working to get the, the IT support to do that so that every 
flying wing doesn't have to develop their own uh, coders and uh, electronic repair people. So that's been a huge uh, success. The DIU has been pivotal, pivotal to making that happen. And what's really uh, phenomenal about that is once we have this common ITD and the methodology worked, we can turn that thing into a T6 or a T38 or an F15 or an F35. Uh, we're working on uh, multi-place uh, models of that for UPT 2.5. So we've got a T1 that we've developed, but then we're gonna be able to turn that into a KC46, a C17, all those kinds of things. And we believe that once uh, Corky and the team figure out how to do multi-level classification uh, on something like that, uh, that there's gonna be huge applicability to this across the force. So in the short term, we wanna get the, the real benchmark we're looking for is to prove out the beta version of this common ITD. And we wanna have 50 each of these units at each of the UPT bases by this summer. So that's the next big milestone. And we're working with uh, Vertex is the, is the contractor that's helping uh, spearhead that uh, out for us. So one of the, that really raises an interesting uh, uh, point from our perspective, you'll have a lot of industry partners uh, on the line listening to this. And I think the really the most important ask that that's related to this is we really need industry to keep pace with these kind of advances. And I've had people say, hey, go ahead and write that into a requirements document and we'll get right back to you. That's not the world we live in. You know, the world we live in is we're gonna need industry uh, to not only set the pace, but, but keep pace with us uh, here. There's no question that we're gonna have an ITD for each of the kinds of airplanes we fly, but it's open to debate who's gonna build them. And so um, that's, that's kind of the road that we're on. All right. Hope that uh, answered much. your question. Yes, you did. Thanks. Corky, uh, Red Flag remains one of the Air Forces in the nation's premier combat training exercises. Now, as the U.S. pivots toward preparing for uh, uh, great power competition, you told, told us a little bit about that. Could you expand on the role that Red, uh, Red Flag serves today in doing that? And um, has the value that Red Flag provides to airmen evolved in recent years? Sir, this is a great question and a timely one. Uh, as as the audience is probably well aware, the Air Force is embarking on a implementation of a new force generation model. And uh, as part of that, uh, the Warfare Center is working across the enterprise with HAF and all the MAGCOMs to do a, a, a full up uh, training and exercise redesign, if you will. Uh, a couple of years ago uh, at a weapons and tactics conference out here at Nellis, uh, someone got on the stage and debriefed the four stars. Uh, look, red flag has become has tried to become something for everybody and it's turned into nothing for anybody. We've, we've lost our original purpose for red flag. And so the, Air, the Warfare Center got the go do to go, hey, go, go fix red flag. And uh, I applaud our folks who started working this because they realized it was, it was bigger than red flag. It, again, it goes back to how we present forces to the combatant commanders and to do what. And if you start there and, and again, go back to the, the core missions and what we need the forces to do. And then as we go to the, embark on this new implementation, this new force generation model, when do we need them to be ready to do it? Are they in the ready phase? Are they committed? Are they resetting and preparing? And now if you look at the joint model on how we do training and exercises, and there's four different tiers with, uh, with tier four being the lowest. So in our terms, basic squadron level, uh, unit level training, and then you get in and you start getting into packages and teams, and then you get into uh, joint and then ultimately COCOM exercises where we, our team said, well, red flag and all the other flags, by the way, because there's red, there's checkered, there's green, there's, uh, there's blue. There's a rescue flag now. There's an ISR flag. So we want to look at the whole portfolio, not just uh, not just red, and see where those fit in. And I said, you know, let's take the colors off. Let's take the red and the checkered off. Let's go. What do we need to do uh, at which tier? Uh, you know, so there's the squadron level basic training, but then flags fall into what we call tier three in the joint world, tier three level training, which is where you start packaging up forces. And what our team came back was, well, we need a we need an OCA strike kind of uh, flag. We need a, a DCA kind of flag. We need an ISR, we need a, uh, a rescue, you know, we need to practice these, these different mission sets uh, as packages in the Air Force and then start bringing in our joint partners. Uh, and then, then we and then we go back and go, okay, well, let's, where are we already doing some of this? Well, red flag is, is sort of that OCA strike and seed focus. So, well, that's what we'll label red flag. Uh, we have green flag is where we do, uh, you know, air land integration to get after cast and things like that. We have a resolute hunter exercise that we're doing with the Navy up at Fallon as part of their uh, air wing workups. And that that is a, an ISR focus. So we're, we're adding that, that as a flag. We have a, a rescue flag that we've worked in down at DM. We have a checkered flag that we pair up with the WESIP uh, events down at Tyndall. And so we'll, we'll probably turn that into a DCA flag. There's another one that's a carrier air wing workup. There's a big DCA exercises up at Fallon. And if you think about a carrier air wing in the South China Sea 
and Raptors and F-35s deployed to that area. Boy, wouldn't it be great for us to pile on with that workout for the force, for the for the strike group that's getting ready to sail out there and our forces that are getting ready to be in the commit then, let's have them train together foul. So we're looking at it going there. So the bottom line is we tie it all back to how we're presenting forces, when the forces need to be ready, what they need to be ready for. And, uh, and so we're working through uh, what we'll call each of those, you know, what will red be, like I said, OCA, checker, DCA, et cetera. Uh, and then we'll start assigning units to those because over the past few years, we've had a, the exercises have kind of taken on a life of their own, which is not a good thing. It's like, we're going to have three red flags a year. So who can we send to them? That's wrong. It should be, our forces need to be ready. These forces need to be ready at this time. Let's send them to Nellis for that piece. Uh, Jay Park, et cetera. That, that goes into another piece of this. I think we can cover later if we talk about uh, partners and allies, perhaps. But uh, big picture is uh, we're trying to get red flag back to uh, its original focus of, of making sure that that, uh, that young uh, um, man or lady is ready for his first 10 combat missions because it has proven its effectiveness uh, uh, through, the, through the late 70s, early 80s, and, and, it, and it played out uh, just as we'd hoped in Desert Storm. So we need to get back to that to ensure our folks are ready for great power competition. Thanks. For both of you, uh, Chief Brown has encouraged the Air Force to accelerate change or lose. Both of you hold critical positions in the Air Force's training enterprise. So what does it mean to accelerate change in training and education? Corky, why don't you go first? Well, let me, let me begin by saying I, I think Chief Brown nailed it. Uh, and you know, we're at a pivotal point for our nation. This is not just for our Air Force, but, uh, but for our nation, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. So uh, we really need to get after that. And the way he laid it out in such simple terms in his four, uh, his four orders that he directed, airmen, bureaucracy, competition, and design implementation, that's exactly the path we need to be marching down. What we've talked a lot about here today, especially Pulse, is our airmen. How do we bring them in? How do we train them to do what the nation needs its airmen to do? That's got to be first and foremost in our mindset. Uh, number two, the bureaucracy. We, we've got to change the way we do business. We can't do things as I talked earlier in serial. We need to do, get to DevSecOps. The future is software, harnessing big data and going fast with our open mission systems on our aircraft with the way we train pilots, et cetera. So the bureaucracy cannot get in that way. In the way. We need to collaborate better across the Air Force, across the Joint Force, across the Energy Agency, and across our allies. Competition has to be at the, at, at the forefront of everything we're doing. We have to keep our eyes on the prize. We have to understand the threat better than they understand themselves if we're gonna, if we're gonna train uh, our airmen uh, to win. So, uh, you know, in every venue, we've got to make sure that we're talking a pacing threat China and also keeping our eye on the Russia's, Iran's, North Korea's and other, others that may pop up. And, and finally, a design implementation. Uh, we got to put our money where our mouth is. We got to build a force that's going to give our airmen the tools they need and the tra training and test infrastructure they need uh, to go out and win uh, should we have to fight. Thanks again for the opportunity, sir. Yeah, very good. Joe Wills, your response? Thanks, sir. I think Corky really nailed it. I mean, um, I second everything he said. And I, I think the one thing I'd say from the ATC perspective, or at least from 19th, the, the one thing we really need to wake up every morning with is a really solid appreciation for the fact that, guarantee, that we're not guaranteed to win. I mean, we can lose. And we've been so good for so long, and we've been uh, unchecked for so long that arrogance and hubris can get into the mix right here and it can put us in a really bad spot as a nation. So I think when it comes to accelerating change, you got to start from the standpoint of if we're not careful, we'll fall behind and that's unacceptable for our nation. The next thing I think you have to do is take on the culture, your own culture. We're all, we're changing things that work and it's the hardest thing. You know, it'd be one, nobody has a problem innovating when, when something's broken down by the side of the road, everybody gets it. But when you're taking a system that already fundamentally works and you're asking people to radically reimagine it, it's a very difficult thing, but we have got to, to look beyond ourselves and the way that we were brought up and trained. We've got to make this what it needs to be, not the way we thought it used to be or, or should be. And so I think that's really the fundamental uh, part of it is we have to be willing to look ourselves in the eye objectively. And then we've got to move out and in places where it's appropriate, we've got to take risk. Not taking risk with people's lives and training, but taking administrative risk and, and being brave enough to try new things and challenging established norms. And so I think it really gets down to aggressively seeking out victory for our nation. Sir, thanks for the opportunity today. Well, thank you both. We've uh, unfortunately come to the end of this uh, virtual aerospace warfare symposium event. Uh, and once again, I'd like to express my appreciation and uh, that of all of the Air Force Association 
uh, to both of you for your comments on these critical issues. So on behalf of all of us at AFA, um, we wish you all the very best as you uh, continue to deal with the challenges that affect the readiness and experience of our airmen. And from the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, we hope you all have a great aerospace power kind of day out here. <laughs>